Cheryl Swopes, <laughs> she's a dumb job. If you doubt me, watch this three minute video of Swopes attempting to explain away the ridiculous attack she unleashed three weeks ago on record breaking Iowa basketball star, Caitlin Clark. Take a listen. I, I'm gonna say this, and then I wanna like be done with this whole conversation. So for people to come at me and say that I made those comments because I'm a racist, like, first of all, black people can't be racist. Oh, God. Mm. Balls. But, like, that's the farthest thing from my mind. Like, I grew up in a very small West Texas town, predominantly white. My best childhood friend is white. Went to a predominantly white college, won a national championship. Pretty much everyone on the team was white. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm white. Like, we're sisters to this day. Like, like, that's not a part of my DNA. But for me, it's very important, though, that, like, I'm a black woman, you know? So it's important for me that I speak up for people that look like me. Like, it's Black History Month. So, like our ancestors fought and died for us to have opportunities that we have today. So anytime I have an opportunity to obviously be on the podcast or, or anything where I feel like it's important for me to speak up um, and show support, that's what I want to do. Um, I have like no issues with Caitlin, her breaking the record, I think obviously is a tremendous accomplishment. Although, you know, we could get into that discussion also. Come on, if you're racist and you know it, clap your hands. Because there was a big debate on Lynette Woodard having yeah. the actual record. Um, but I, I think what Caitlin has done for not just college basketball, but for women's basketball, period, I think has been great. The following, people watching the game, sellouts that we haven't seen ever. Um, it just really bothers me, though, when when people just take bits and pieces of what they want to take, <laughs> and they don't listen to everything, and you don't hear everything. Because I do remember me saying that Caitlin, to me, could be the best college shooter I've ever seen, right? Um, so I don't. I don't have any hard feelings towards Caitlin, no hard feelings toward, towards Angel. I My thing is, when you put these expectations on these young women in college to go to the next level and be immediately dominant. And when that doesn't happen, then people come back and say, oh, she was a bust, she yep. was a flop, she wasn't yep. that good. <clears throat> like, just let them do what they're doing in college, enjoy what they're doing in college, and let them become stars in the WNBA. At the toilet store? Like, it's not about me liking you, not liking you, me hating on you. Like, I don't even know how to let those words come out of my mouth. But, um, yeah, it was just, it was a lot. Yeah. But I do, I, and I have to say this before we move on. So, to, like, every single person on social media that, like, held it down for me, that was like, oh, no, we're not doing this. Like, I got mad love and respect for all of them for showing up and showing out and making sure that I was good because people were checking on me. Um, and, and I'm very appreciative of that. I told you, what did I tell you? Didn't I tell you? Cause I told you, mm-hmm. Did, did you just see what Cheryl Swopes did there? She, one, she made herself the victim. And she, I wanna thank everybody that was looking out for me and showing up and showing out to make sure I was okay and I was good. Cheryl Swopes did something very aggressive, took a pot shot. I wanna give you all the context so you can understand that three minute diatribe of gobbledygook. And the other way she moved the goalpost is like, okay, uh, we got a cake baked for Caitlin Clark when she joins the WNBA. Oh, th that super strong, angry lesbian culture is going to destroy Caitlin Clark when she gets to the WNBA. J just because I want you to think about what, what she's trying to move the goalposts and say is that, oh, yeah, great college career. She's a great shooter. 
but that ain't gonna work in the WNBA. And I was just looking out for her. Cause when she gets to the WNBA, you know, they're gonna call her a flop. So here comes Clark. How will she go for history? That's to get for Cleveland. They have the Curry. Curry sets, fires, puts it up. Bang! It's not going, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it ain't going, mm, nah. Nah, it ain't going to work. And that's because th they're planning to destroy Clay Caitlin Clark when she gets to the WNBA. But let me provide you a little background on what has transpired with Caitlin Clark and Cheryl Swoops. Uh, with Clark on the brink of establishing a new scoring standard for women's basketball, Swopes, Hall of Fame player, blasted Caitlin Clark on Gilbert Arenas' podcast. Swoops alleged, and this is three weeks ago, that Clark is only setting the new standard because she played five years, is 25 years old, and shoots 40 times a game. None of Swoops' allegations are true. Clark is 22, she's completing her fourth season at Iowa, and over the course of her career, she averages about 20 shots per game. Caitlin Clark is white. Swoops, as you can see, is black. Swoops' original critique was so off base, many observers concluded racial bias and jealousy contributed to Swoops' ignorant claims. So, earlier this week, Cheryl Swoops circled back to Gilbert Arenas' podcast to defend herself from the charges of racism. Swopes left little doubt that she's ignorant if we just played the comments, but let me repeat a couple of things that I, I mean, I just found just ridiculous. Her, her comment off the top, for people to come at me like and say, I made those comments because I'm racist. Like, first of all, black people can't be racist. That's ignorant comment number one. But the people are retarded. But that's like the farthest thing from my mind. Like, I grew up in a very small town, West Texas town, that was predominantly white. My best childhood friend is white. I went to a predominantly white college, won a national championship. I even screwed a couple of white boys when I was in college. Like, we brothers and sisters to this day. Like, that's not my DNA at all. But for me, it's very important though, that like, I'm a black woman. So it's important for me that I speak up for people that look like me. It's Black History Month. Like our ancestors fought and died for us to have opportunities that we have today. That's... <laughs> oh, this, this, this is comical. That actually is <laughs> pretty funny. Show Swopes. Her clarification is every bit as dumb and problematic as her original criticism of Caitlin Clark. Swopes is 52. She thinks and talks and acts like an 18 year old college freshman. Years ago, when Swopes was an impressionable teenager, someone she thought was smart likely told her, you know, black people can't be racist because black people have no power to oppress white people. Swopes swallowed that lie years ago. She's never been forced to spit the lie out because corporate media, academia, and the so-called black church reinforce the lie every chance they get. The media, academia, and the black church love to talk about the word racism, which is never used in the Bible. In reality, Swopes suffers from idolatry, the root of all sin. She's made her skin color an idol. That's why, in this podcast interview, she's wearing a t-shirt that stated, I am black history. Now, Cheryl Swopes is not an image bearer of God, a follower of Jesus Christ, a vessel seeking the power of the Holy Spirit. Cheryl Swopes is black history. She proudly proclaims it on the front of her t-shirt. Race is her idol, no different from white KKK members who have made sk their skin their idol. People who make race their idol have no problem mistreating people who don't look like them. It's silly to argue black people are incapable of allowing racial idolatry to rule them. Are people with dark skin incapable of idolatry? Are we superior to people of a different hue? And if, you th if we think we're superior, wouldn't that make us racist? Wouldn't that make us prone to diminish the accomplishments of a white girl like Caitlin Clark? 
Of the many lies American blacks have swallowed, the most damaging one is the lie that we possess no power and no agency in our own lives. It's a lie founded in the belief that what happens to us is far more important than what we do. That's how you convince people to do less and to look to others to do more. At her core, Cheryl Swopes believes what she does does not matter. Yeah, so what? She said a bunch of ridiculous things about Caitlin Clark. It doesn't matter. Swopes is a history-making black queen. She's above accountability. She owes no apologies. She's free to adopt the attitudes, behaviors, and excuses of white bigots because her bigotry is inconsequential and or justified. Now you have become the very thing you swore to destroy. Her ancestors were mistreated. She's earned the privilege to mistreat others. Her skin color makes her above consequential sin. Let's ask a serious question. Do black people have the power in this country to oppress white people? I'm like, I don't think so, Scooter. Let's ask Daniel Penny, the former Marine who is being prosecuted by Alvin Bragg's district attorney office for subduing a crazed homeless man in a New York subway. Fear of Black Lives Matter protest and unrest has caused corporate media to portray the crazed homeless man as a harmless Michael Jackson impersonator just moments away from turning his life completely around. Black power isn't the reason Derek Chauvin and three other cops are locked away for being at the scene of George Floyd's fentanyl overdose. Black power isn't the reason Ashley Babbitt's murderer is considered a hero. Human beings, regardless of skin tone, have power. Human beings fall victim to all kinds of idolatry. Black people's idolatry of choice is racial idolatry. White friends, white teammates, small town upbringings don't immunize black people from racial idolatry. Obedience to God is the only cure for idolatry. If you notice, Cheryl Swopes did not say, I'm not racist because my relationship with God makes me view people who don't look like me as brothers and sisters in Christ. Nope. She pivoted to talking about black womanhood and what she owed black women. I told you, what did I tell you? Didn't I tell you? Cause I told you, mm-hmm. Like a lot of dumb jocks, she's immersed in the worship of the black matriarchy. That's my fire starter. Started with a fire today. Uh, welcome, welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I'm Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Thursday. Glad you joined me. Uh, this episode is brought to you by our good friends at Good Ranchers. Fall in love with beef, chicken, and seafood all over again by subscribing at GoodRanchers.com. Use my promo code Fearless to get $240 in free bacon. Bacon, bacon, bacon. I love bacon. I love Good Ranchers. Thank you, Good Ranchers, for uh, jumping back on board. Make sure you guys are jumping on board uh, with Good Ranchers. Awesome show for you today. We started the fire early, just came right out of the box with that fire. Mm, love it. Funny. Pretty enlightening. You know what I'm calling Cheryl Swopes? The Great Black Dope. Because racial idolatry is the dope that has black people going crazy. It's the dope that has us hallucinating. It's the dope that's killing us. Cheryl Swopes embodies that. The Great Black Dope, that's our conversation day. We're gonna talk with Shamika Michelle here in a second and talk about, unpack like, can black people be racist? Cheryl Swopes says, no. Doesn't explain why, but we've all heard the trope it has been going on for 40, 50 years. Black people can't be racist. We have no power. We'll get into that with Shamika Michelle in just a second. Before we do, before we get to Shamika Michelle, <clears throat> I want to talk to you guys about uh, our great friends at Prize Picks. Whether it's tournament season or the race for the playoff home court, cash in on basketball's biggest moments with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Just select two or more players, pick more or, or less on their projections, and place your entry. 
Turn $10 into $1,000 with just four correct picks. You can choose from traditional stats like Steph Curry, more or less points, or more unique ones like Kevin Durant, more or less on dunks. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, Injury insurance on your picks or what make Prize Picks America's number one fantasy sports app. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 3 million users who have already signed up. <coughs> you guys know Mama Whitlock, my mom, is a big basketball fan, and she sent me some of her basketball picks she's selecting for today. Uh, Mama Whitlock has Jimmy Butler, more than 19 and a half points versus Denver. Uh, Draymond Green, less then basically zero three-pointers tonight is what my mother's saying against the New York Knicks. And college basketball sensation, the black Caitlin Clark, Juju Watkins, more than 30 and a half points tonight versus Arizona. Uh, right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use the promo code FEARLESS. That's code FEARLESS on Prize Picks for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks. Pick more, pick less, it's that easy. Must be present in certain states. Visit prizepicks.com for restrictions and details. Prize picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. All right, uh, after saying all that and after hearing that fire starter, let's roll out to uh, North Carolina and bring in the first lady of the fearless army, uh, Shamika Michelle. Uh, Shamika, uh, let's start real easy. Here, uh, can black people, can, can we be racist? Absolutely. To me, what is this whole black power or, you know, I, I'm, I'm rooting for everyone black. That is the idea that a race is superior for no other reason but because of the skin color. So, yes, black people can be racist. And I wish they would stop with this whole we have no power. That's not even the simple definition of racism. Stop the lies. So and just be honest, if you believe black people are superior just because they're black, say that. But trying to change the definition is so disingenuous. It just is silly. You know, this trope, this idea that black people can't be racist uh, has been around for a long time. I remember hearing it when I was in college. I, I remember saying it and maybe even believing it when I was in college and, and when I was pretty naive and stupid. But, but at least back then, let's, if we dial the clock back 35, 40 years, there had been no black president. Uh, there weren't a bunch of black people on, in high powered television positions uh, on air. There weren't a bunch of black mayors all over the country. And, and so it had a tiny bit of legitimacy because one thing I believe about racism is, it, you know, it does have some impact. It's, it's not just hurt feelings. Uh, but we've reduced it down to, you know, if someone says something that hurts your feelings and it has any type of racial connotation, it's racist. But, but, but now that we're here in 2024 and the largest cities in America, from New York to L.A., have black mayors, uh, now that we're here and Fannie Willis and the Letitia James can bring charges against a former president of the United States. Now that we're here and again, Barack Obama was president for eight years and most people think his wife is going to run for president this year. It's, I mean, we got to cut it out. I mean, we have, look, in my view, George Floyd died of a fentanyl o overdose. Derek Chauvin and three other cops are in prison because black people showed their power through protests and riots and unrest and forced a jury to convict these guys and pretend like George Floyd was some angel sent from heaven who was snuffed out by a group of Klan wearing uh, police officers. Th that's black power. That's black people exercising their power and forcing a jury to do something or a criminal justice system to do something 
it's laughable at this point to run around and pretend like we have no power, no say so in this country and no ability to harm people based on race. It just is a stupid argument. Yeah, 35 or 40 years ago, Jason, I was an egg. <clears throat> Pretend with me. <laughs> um, but <laughs> that's why we see now we have black people doing the Super Bowl. That's how Snoop Dogg was able to crip walk, you know, uh, for the halftime show. We have so many things where we have actually taken over to actually say we don't have power is just not a real thing. And when people pretend like they're not con constantly pushing this whole racism thing, it's 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 a lie. You know, I heard this woman say before that black people aren't even looking for equality. They want to switch places and be the dominant race, the ones that have people out in the cotton fields. I mean, when you look at the anger that some black people have now towards white people, you have to believe that we can be racist. This is why so many of them get upset with me, get upset with you, because we don't hate white people just for being white. I was having a conversation with a friend recently, and she was saying how it upsets her when a, a white woman will say to her girl and I'm like that's not even like it doesn't make me upset because so many of them grew up in the same with the same culture that we did watching the same television shows li listening to the same music so when they say to me girl it's the same thing as when I say to my black friends hey girl or girl it's not something derogatory that they're just sitting around thinking, let me, you know, go to say to this black woman, girl, we are so caught up in skin color that we can't even enjoy pure relationships with someone of a different race because we are just we idolize skin color. And so I just wish black people would say, hey, we have an issue or, you know, individually say, I have an issue. These things bother me. Why? I did not suffer the discrimination of my grandmothers or great grandmothers or these ancestors we like to talk about all the time. I didn't suffer that. Why do I have a chip on my shoulder? Why am I walking around hating someone for the color of their skin that never did anything to me? And until we get to that place where we can rip off those layers and stop lying, I don't think we can move forward or these people won't be able to move forward and just form genuine connections with people. We can, in fact, be racist and we need to be honest about that. I'm going to go a step further than can be racist. It's like we have moved from a society and a culture where we stigmatize white bigotry to white anti-black bigotry to the point that white people have completely changed up and I'm generalizing, not all, but mo most white people have completely changed how they interact and engage with black people because they've been trained like, whew, if I do anything racist, I could cost me my job, it could cost me my reputation, you know, it could put me in real trouble. And so they've gone through that shock treatment and, and, and to the point to where, I mean, white people, particularly in the South, but uh, around the country, they used to say the N word as comfortably as we now say the N word. And now they go out of their way to avoid using the N word in just casual conversation. You can see their behavior changing. White people, uh, it used to be, when I, I'm old enough to remember, interracial dating used to be a big deal. I mean, a big deal. If somebody, you know, crossed the street sexually, in high school or whatever, that was a big deal. Everybody was talking about it at the high school, and I can't, you know, both sides, black and white. Now, it's nothing. And and I've just lived long enough to remember when, like, white boys would be like, oh, she slept with a black dude, I wouldn't touch her. 
to 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 now, that it's it's just a complete non-issue at this. We got TV shows where white women are going after black bachelors on national TV. Is we've seen their behavior change, and I've seen our behavior change. And at this point, I honestly believe we have far more of a racist problem among black people than we do among the average white person. I, I'm so, I, I, I believe that. I, I, I've seen it when it was the reverse, and now I see it for what it is now. I've lived 56 years on this planet. I can't believe like the roles have flipped. And I expect to see more casual racism from black people than I do from white people. Oh, absolutely, Jason. We will. It will continue to get worse, especially when you have people like Cheryl that won't even acknowledge that it exists. And people are just going along with it. Even when I think about myself, Jason, you've heard me say before, I won't date white men. I, some people say that's prejudice. Some people say it's racist. But I would have to say, if I'm being completely transparent and honest, some of that might would fall in into the category of me thinking black men are superior. Now, does that mean I would watch a white man be harmed or hurt or I would keep him from some type of job? No, but I would simply not date him because of his skin color. That's me being transparent. That's me being honest. Is that fair? I don't know. But it's the truth. And until we can just be honest about some of these things, that's, you know, we're, we're just going to continue to lie. So you're right. We're going to see it get worse. I, I laugh at the women that I hang around that are white who just I see them exhale when we get together because they know little jokes are not going to hurt my feelings. Things that they say are not going to hurt my feelings. If they have a question about my hair, I can just honestly answer them. I may have questions about their hair. I have a friend. It takes her two hours every day to wash her hair, blow it dry, straighten it and curl it every day. And I'm like, girl, I don't even want to do that once a week. Y'all have seen me struggle for the last couple of weeks with these twists I had in my hair, having to take them out. Some of them are locked. I still got to take the time to comb them out. She does this every day. And so we can have these conversations with her saying, my gosh, how does your hair go from being looking two inches long to looking, you know, seven, eight inches long. These are conversations that you can have when you just stop the lies and stop worshiping skin color and honestly uh, embrace the differences that we may have. You know, um, it, it's, it's a big deal because here we are, Jason, in 2024, and you would think some of the things that our, our parents or grandparents had to deal with would not be our issue, but it is. I even hear kids my daughter's age act as if with $1,000 phones in their hands that they are so oppressed and so discriminated against, and that's just not true. It's not true. And I just wish we could really get past it as a people. Now, men, don't come sliding in my inbox because, you know, you want to help me get past it. I'm not budging, but <laughs> we will have good conversation <laughs> and I will be nice. But ain't no dating going on. <laughs> so I, I want to deal with that because you said something very transparent, and very honest and very real. And, and it'll be misinterpreted or misunderstood uh, by a lot of people. But, but again, because I've lived so long and seen so much and so many of my own uh, preconceived notions and things I used to believe in are, are just silly. So my father believed what you believe. And some of it was a lie, found out later from his friends. But, but, but you know, again, my father's a very good looking man, very suave just impeccable dresser and all of that. And, and so he was, you know, a little ghetto heartthrob. And he used to always brag to me 
and particularly, my, I don't know if he said it to my brother, but he certainly said it to me because he knew I like white girls. Uh, he would brag about how he would never sleep with a, a white woman, never give her the pleasure of this. Blah, blah. You know, he, he would say this to me. And all that. Come to find out, you know, he wasn't being totally honest. His, his, his boys ratted him out. But anyway, he, he, he would say that. But, but I've lived long enough to remember there was a time when I would be upset that some white man didn't want his daughter dating a black man. And now I've lived long enough to go, that man has every right to think that. Every single right. I don't have any problem with it at all because one, my father thought that way, my mother thinks that way to this day. Uh, uh, you know, you know, the, the, this been a, a bone of contention in, in my family. And, you know, I got other family members I could name, but I feel very comfortable because my parent, my dad's dead. My mother's lived long enough. She don't care what nobody thinks about her. So I can tell exactly what she thinks. Uh, other people in my family mostly agree with <clears throat> with with my mother and father. And and it, that preference as it relates to dating that, that's so much more complicated than, oh, I don't like this race or that race, because it involves kids and the making of kids. And so I've just lived long enough to go, man, mixed race kids seem to have some issues fitting in. And I don't blame a father, whether he's black or white, saying, don't put, your, don't put my grandkids through that struggle here in America. And I don't blame people because, again, anybody that knows me knows I got no problem with white women. But I do actually, this is just keeping it real. I hope it's understood. I like my skin tone. And I'd like to bless my kids with my skin tone. Just keeping it real. No one, there's no one on the planet that can say I have a problem with white women. It would be a lie. Or with white people in general. But. I do like my skin tone, and I would like to look at my kids, and I'm, I'm, again, I'm too old now, I'm not gonna have kids, but I, I get the mentality of like, I want my kids to look like me. And, and uh, I, I'm not, you gotta just trust me and, and do the home, call my friends, call my family. I got no problem with white women, white people. But I, I get when you're saying, you have a very beautiful skin complexion. You want to see that in your kids. And, and you, when, when you show up at any event, you, you, oh, that's Shamika, that's your kids. Yeah, I can tell, y'all look just alike. People want that experience. And then they, they want to protect their kids from getting caught up in all this racial confusion and racial tension and all these other issues. People have a right to have their preferences. I don't blame any white person that's sitting there saying, I want my grandkids to look like me. And I don't want them caught up in some sort of racial confusion where they turn around and they actually hate me and have to abandon me and my values to serve in this black culture value system that seems to be promoting a bunch of stuff that I completely disagree with. And so we got to be able to have that kind of nuanced discussion, real discussion as it relates to race. And, but but the, the conversation is so unsophisticated because we've dumbed it down and, and we pretend like this group or that group is racist when they're really not. And then we want to say this group can't be racist when they clearly can be. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to put that in the air because I know people are going to misconstrue uh, what mm -hmm. you're saying, but, but have I covered like some of the issues that are real to you as it relates to interracial dating? You know, I think so. Um, maybe. I, I think so. When I think about my children, though, like I would have no issue with them bringing home white men. You know, I've always told them, you know, love is love. And if that's who you fall in love with, that's who you fall in love with. So I wouldn't have a problem seeing that in my grandkids. You know, if if I'm going to be really real, 
like you said, I love my skin tone. And so when I think about holding uh, someone else, you know, I want it to be my skin tone. And I have some white uh, friends who are white males and, you know, it's pink. (laughs) I can't do pink, Jason. I've said it before. (laughs) And so I hate to sound, you know, very shallow, but... (laughs) You know, I'm like uh, India Ari when she said brown skin. You know, I love your brown skin. I can't tell where yours begin. I can't tell where mine's end. I just love that, you know, and that's just what it is. (laughs) People have a right to have their preferences and it doesn't mean that they're racist because, again, I, I didn't. I think that's a, I didn't, I'm not surprised by the comment in terms of it relates to your daughters uh, and who they marry. I'm not surprised at all by, by that. But, but again, it, it just shows you how complicated this issue is. It, it's not about racism. It, it, it's, it's like my preference, what you're saying is, for a black man. That, that's who I fantasize about or whatever. Uh, and, you know, anyway, I I just, I wanted to, I'm glad we went there. This is a bit more complicated or maybe a bit more than I I wanted to go, but I just had to throw that in there because some people are going to watch this and and think uh, that me and or you, and well, there's just no way. They couldn't make the argument about me. The the facts just speak for themselves. Uh, (laughs) But uh, anyway, Shamika, uh, thank you so much. Uh, We'll see you, I believe, on Saturday. So, uh, Shamika, thank you for helping me get through uh, the, the great black dope. Uh, Cheryl Swopes and what she had to say about Caitlin Clark and can black people be racist. I'm going to uh, unpack <laughs> another little daily dose of Stephen A. Smith here for you uh, in the next segment. Uh, Stephen A. Smith uh, talked yesterday about Uh, Jam Master J and his relationship uh, with Jam Master J, who was murdered 20 some odd years ago. There were convictions for that murder earlier this week. Stephen A. Smith talked about it yesterday. And I'm gonna expose to you again some more of uh, Stephen A and his stretching of the truth. Uh, And then after I do that, Steve Kim's going to uh, join me. We're gonna talk about Pat McAfee. He's back at war with ESPN. That's fascinating and interesting as well. I want to make sure those of you that uh, are making your plans to come visit me and us here at Roll Call, Roll Call 2.0, right here in Nashville, Tennessee, on Saturday, June 1st. Uh, Make sure you're going to uh, fearlessarmyrollcall.com, fearlessarmyrollcall.com. Hopefully today the ticket information and the hotel information is there. We got some special discounted rates Uh, For you church leaders, if you're bringing a group, uh, we'd love to give you some discounted tickets and roll out the red carpet for you. Uh, Fearless Army Roll Call 2.0, but fearlessarmyrollcall.com is where you need to go for all the information. It's got a great cast of speakers. Want you here uh, at all the events and being called being called to sacrifice so that we can experience growth, so that we can experience progress, so that we can experience the protection of the freedoms and the rights that come from our creator, our God. Uh, FearlessArmyRollCall.com. Go there, sign up, and uh, I'll be back uh, with more next. Hello, Fearless Army. I'm Jason Whitlock, your leader. I'm going to spend 2024 discussing growth and sacrifice. Hard times are here. Harder times are coming. What has stopped American growth and caused a regression in fundamental freedoms and values? A lack of sacrifice. Our ancestors sacrificed for our benefit. We have not sacrificed to protect the progress they died for. No sacrifice no freedom. What impedes man's willingness to sacrifice? His ignorance, his perversion, his pride, his ingratitude, 
and his cowardice, his rejection of God. The Bible is a story about the power and the necessity of sacrifice. Sacrifice is the sun, rain, and fertilizer of growth. Growth is our life purpose. Grow in the knowledge, wisdom, fear, obedience, and reverence to the Most High. Growth requires sacrifice will be our theme for Roll Call 2.0 this summer, June 1, right back here in Nashville. We're excited to welcome you. Let me spend a minute explaining what G-R-O-W-T-H actually stands for, for us in the Fearless Army. The G is for game plan. In order to properly grow, it's essential we work from the strategic game plan spelled out in the Bible. The R, responsibility. As we grow as men, we understand and accept our responsibilities to God, family, and teammates. The O, ownership. We embrace ownership of our destiny. Outsiders do not determine our fate. The W, wisdom. We honor, value, and share the wisdom imparted to us by elders, coaches, and leaders. The T, trust. We must be worthy of trust. The reliability of a man's word defines him far more than popularity and material possessions. The H, humility. The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. That's straight from Proverbs 22 and four. Come join us in Nashville as we talk about growth and sacrifice and how without sacrifice, there will be no growth. Roll Call 2.0 right here in Nashville, Saturday, June 1st. Welcome back. Uh, I don't know if we should call this a daily dose of Stephen A. Smith, or should we just call it Stephen A. Cap? Maybe we should just call this Stephen A. Cap. Call this the SAC segment, S-A-C. Stephen A. Cap. I kind of like Stephen A. Cap. Uh, and so here's today's dose of Stephen A. Cap. Uh, let, let's, let's stick, Justin, if you're, let's work on something for next week. When I do my Stephen A. Uh, deal, we'll call it Stephen A. Cap and we'll come up with a Stephen A. Cap intro. Uh, so Stephen A. Smith or Stephen A. Myth, uh, yesterday talked about, uh, the murder convictions in the Jam Master J trial. Jam Master J, of course, one of the, uh, three members of the, iconic rap group Run DMC. Uh, they're from Hollis, Queens, uh, the place where Stephen A. Smith says he grew up in Hollis, Queens as well. And so Stephen A., uh, with the murder convictions, Jam Master J was killed, I believe, 20, 21, 22 years ago uh, in a tragic incident. Uh, they just now, in the past year or two, uh, found the right two guys that did it uh, and convicted them earlier this week. So uh, Stephen A. Smith felt like he had to talk about it. These are guys from Hollis, Queens, his neighborhood. Let's play the clip of uh, Stephen A. Smith talking about Jam Master J and Run DMC and how his brother had a relationship uh, with Jam Master J. Pulled a gun out and shot Jam Master J twice in the head at close range. He died on the scene. It's a personal story for me because I grew up with Jam Master J. Right there in Hollis, Queens, New York. Both of us lived on 23rd, 203rd Street. He was on one avenue, I was on another. He was very, very good friends with my late brother, Basil, who passed away in a car accident in 1992. That was the last time I saw Jam Master J, which was a few months later, because he was gone and he was out of the country. They had been, Run DMC had been performing. And when he came back and he saw me, I was the one who informed him that Basil had passed away. He didn't even know at the time. I've always loved that brother. Definitely was sad when I heard that his life was taken from him so unceremoniously so viciously. Um, I still miss him to this very day. 
Run DMC was special, no doubt about it. But Jam Master J was a part of it. Somebody making that music for him. He was a good brother in a lot of different ways. I know my brother Basil loved him to death. And I did as well. And so when I heard the news that the assailants, the murderers, were convicted, I'd like to say it was joyous, but it wasn't. It was sad. Because in the end, what it really, really comes down to is that three lives have now been lost. So <clears throat> those of you that are Stephen A. Smith groupies, or even haters, but you groupies, y'all need to let Stephen A. Smith know that when he starts lying and exaggerating and goes into full-blown Stephen A. Cap mode, I've already told him, like, hey, bro, I've read your book. I've done the research. I, I, I'm going to call you out on these things. And, and so I think Stephen A. thinks, like, it's 2019, 2021, 2022. But it's some long-gone era when he could just get away with saying whatever he wants and no one was going to check him on it. Stephen A. chose to pick a fight with me. And so I'm in this fight for the long haul. And so Stephen A, don't just go to your podcast, just don't go on TV and say anything willy nilly because we're going to fact check you on this show. And, and so many of you all have missed the point and, and think some people are like, man, uh, Whitlock called him out for his fake basketball career. And I did call him out for his fake basketball career. But if you go back and watch the original show I did about Stephen A's memoir, Straight Shooter, A Lifetime of First Takes and Second Chances, or, or whatever it's called, I, I, I read his memoir and I walked you through how like virtually everything that Stephen A. Smith says about his life and background is either a lie or exaggerated. It's either a lie or it's exaggerated. And this goes well beyond just his make-believe Winston-Salem State basketball career. I broke my kneecap in half. I got a six-inch screw in my knee. Big House Gaines was my, like a father figure to me. I know he didn't mention me in his book. I know that there's the Wilt Chamberlain photo. I know that there's this stat sheet, and I know I can't remember. <clears throat> I've gone well beyond that. And, and I tried to explain to you that everything in his book is a fabrication or an exaggeration. None of it's true. The guy's job is to lie about everything. And I believe He's lying here as it relates to Jam Master J. And I'm going to walk you through why. And I would love for Stephen A. Smith to answer this for me. Because Stephen A., I read your book. You wrote the book. You've been very clear. You wrote it. You didn't have a ghost writer. It's you. So walk me through this. I want to uh, Read you a quote from Stephen A's book. I believe this is on page 42. And this is where in writing, he talks about uh, Basil and, and gives a clue that, that kind of makes me say, well, hold on, man. Because earlier in the book or at some point in the book, he, same thing he said on his podcast about how his brother was close to Jam Master J and they were good friends. So <clears throat> Stephen A, a journalist is reading your book and doing a legitimate review. I know no one else in the media will touch this. They don't care that the top person in the sports media industry is a pathological fabricator or exaggerator. No one cares that you are plant and installed and you have a hostile relationship with the truth. I happen to care and I'm going to call you out on. So here's on page 42 of Stephen A's book. Basil and I weren't all that close growing up. He was nine years older. And when I was eight, he left to join the Air Force, literally the day after graduating from high school. That's Stephen A. Smith 
in his own words. His brother, nine years older, left for the Air Force immediately after graduating high school. Why is that important? Because again, I, I've done the homework and I've done the research. I wanna put up the birthdays of the members of Run DMC, and I wanna put up the birthdays of Stephen A. Smith and his brother. Jam Master J, real name Jason Mizell. This is the man that was murdered. Uh, January 21st, 1965. Uh, Daryl Mack, better known as DMC. 531-1964. Reverend Run, Joseph Simmons. 11-14-1964. Stephen A. Smith's birthday is 10-14-1967. Basil Smith, Stephen A. Smith's brother. November 11th. 1958, so 1958, Basil. And so nine years older than Stephen A. Smith, as soon as Basil uh, graduated high school, he left for the Air Force, according to Stephen A.'s book. So that means that in 1976, 1976, 77 at the latest, but 1976, Basil left Hollis, Queens for New York, and according to his book, Basil didn't get along with Stephen A. Smith's dad and all of that, and he just couldn't wait to get away, and then when he came back, he worked in Texas and other places, didn't come back to Hollis, Queens. The man left in 1976. How old was Jam Master J in 1976? Well, <clears throat> I know I was not good at math, but <laughs> I think if my math is right, if I carry the one, the two, go back, uh, did, 1965, I believe, scroll back, let me see, make sure I get this date right. Jam, 1965. So in 1976, Jam Master J is 11 years old. And he's very, very, very good friends with Basil, Stephen A's brother. An 18 year old is very, very good friends with an 11 year old in Hollis, Queens. An 18 year old is very, very good friends with an 11 year old in Indianapolis, Indiana in Gary, Indiana, in Nashville, Tennessee, in Orange County, California, in Kansas City, Missouri. An 18-year-old, very, very good friends with an 11-year-old. Make it make sense. Think it through. T take a moment. If you need to count on hands and feet, just, just think it through. He's lying. What were an 11-year-old and an 18-year-old? Or what was a 17-year-old and a 10-year-old? Or a 16-year-old and a 9-year-old? What was their very, very close friendship based on? Is he trying to tell us something about Basil and young kids? Or is he exaggerating? Is he lying? Is he making it up? It, is, is he being very careful and delicate with how he unpacks this story? Because it would make far, far more sense for Stephen A. Smith to claim, hey, uh, I was very good friends with Run DMC growing up. I was born in 1967. These guys were born in 1964 and 1965. They were on my block. And just remember, and I, I wish I didn't, I meant to ask these guys uh, to get the tape of Stephen A, where he talked about he was protected on his block. The drug dealers had put the word out that Stephen A. Smith was untouchable. I, I forgot to ask these guys to get that clip, but we played it previously. You gotta remember, Stephen A. Smith is untouchable in his neighborhood. He was such a basketball prodigy, and he was such a good student that the drug dealers and everybody in that community 
has said, hands off Stephen A. Smith. He's untouchable. Remember. So he's a well-known kid in that neighborhood. But he doesn't have a relationship with any of the guys from Run DMC who are a lot closer to his age than his brother. Think it through. Why is he lying? He knows he can't say that he was close friends with any of these guys from Run DMC because these other two, DMC and Reverend Run, they're still alive. And they, they, they might have to come comment on, yeah, tell us about growing up with Stephen A. Smith and how tight y'all were. He, they're not willing to participate in that lie. As far as I know, and you guys will have to help me out, <clears throat> help me out here, but as far as I know, as far as I've been able to tell, I could be wrong. But first take, is basically a hip hop sports show. Has any member uh, from Run DMC been on first take at any time? Because I, I say that to say, y'all here, and again, Tech Nine, uh, not as big a deal as Run DMC. But you hear, I've talked about Tech Nine and being in Kansas City and being friends with uh, Tech Nine and the 57th Street Road Dog villains and uh, <laughs> I could drop <laughs> Rich the Factor. The, those of you, you have to really, really know independent rap music to know Rich the Factor in Kansas City. But any rap name you hear me drop, there's pictures of me with them. Uh, there's likely video of me. I've had Tech Nine on different things I've done, either at ESPN or maybe even at Fox Sports. But I was on a Tech Nine album, KOD, King of Darkness. I'm on there, interview with Jason Whitlock. And I'm not saying that to brag. Because, again, y'all know how I feel about hip-hop and me and Tech and the 57th Street Road Dog Village and Rich the Factor and, uh, why can't I think, the Popper. We all argued about rap music. I liked it, but I was a critic of it. And these guys would get upset with me from time to time. And Bakari and T. T. Will, and they get, they get upset with me from time to time. We'd argue about all of it. But here's Stephen A. Smith allegedly grew up a block on the same block as Run DMC. And, and just like his, we can't get no pictures of it. As far as I know, maybe y'all can correct, maybe Run DMC has been on first take and they've talked about all of this. I, I don't know, I haven't seen it. Haven't been able to find it. But it just doesn't make sense. He's lying, he's fabricating. His brother, left at 18 in 1976 when Jam Master J was an 11 year old little kid and you're on TV pretending like they were BFF? If so, uh, Basil got some explaining to do. Basil's passed, he, he died. We checked, that story isn't fabricated. He died in a car accident. Stephen A, where his brother died, in, Stephen A actually lists the wrong city in the book where Basil actually died in Texas. I mean, Stephen A's book is just littered with factual mistakes. All to what city Basil died in. I got the records of where he died at. Stephen A doesn't even, he don't even know when his parents got married. He lists 1958 and in the book, he says parents got married in 1958 and then uh, shortly thereafter, my oldest sister, Linda, uh, they got pregnant with her right after they got married. And again, he says, and, and these are small details, but again, you're writing a book, you're a best-selling author, you're, you're worth all this money, you have editors. They didn't fact check anything. Linda was born in 1957, according to her birth certificate, and she was the first child. She's born in 1957, Stephen A says in the book, 
uh, <laughs> that the parents got married in 58 and shortly thereafter got pregnant with Linda. It, there are so many factual errors, so many just, I just don't know how it happens unless it's all a stretch, an exaggeration, a fabrication. But I want someone out there to ask Stephen A. Smith, explain to me how his brother is BFF with an 11 year old. Growing up in Hollywood, they were very, very close. I know my brother loved him to death. Did they become friends? You gotta remember, I think Basil, according to Stephen A's book and our research, I think he died in 1992 at the age of 33. I know he died at the age of 33. So you, you, you leave, is, is my math right on that? If you're born in 1958 and you die in, yeah, you're either 33 or 34. And so you leave in 76, maybe they became, he comes home from the Air Force and he becomes friends with, uh, you know, six, seven years later when Jam Master J is 18 and, and, and Run DMC is taking off in the early 80s. Maybe they became BFF then. Maybe the 24-year-old Jam Master J became best friends with 31-year-old uh, Basil Smith when he was on leave from the Air Force or whatever job, whatever city he was working in, maybe that's when they all connected. But someone help Stephen A. unpack that, explain that. To me, it sounds more like Cap. It sounds a lot like, let's play the video of Stephen A. talk about how protected he was in his neighborhood. It sounds a lot like this story. That we just finished talking about when I talk about how, you know, I'm not snitching, I'm not talking, I'm mm -hmm. not getting into people's personal business or whatever. I grew up with that code. I grew up with that code. Um, you know, one of the biggest drug dealers in Hollis literally lived directly across the street from me, you know, um, and yeah. he was a killer. And it was understood Steve is not to be touched. You got dealers in Hollis. Steve is not to be touched. You know, they understood that there was potential in me and they literally threatened. They were going to whip my ass if they ever saw me on the really? corner involved in the drug game in any way. They said we didn't have a choice. How did you they do. know? How did they know that about you? They would see me on the basketball court. First of all, the level of diligence that I put forth that I'd shoot like 300 J's a day and stuff like that. They'd see me in school. You know, they know I came home. I do my homework, put in the work, whatever. They knew that I wasn't trying to be about that life. And so their whole mentality was, you know, you got your mother there. You got your four older sisters there, active part of your life. You got a support system. You don't have to do this. We did. We made our choice. But we ain't going to let you make this choice. And literally, I've had several of them tell me, well, we will f*** you up. Do not be on this corner. Do not be doing this. Do not be going to bust yeah. your ass. Wow. And they meant it. And I knew they meant it. And so they would sit up there. They'd let me shoot, stuff like that, get dark. They had to get into their game. they said, say, all right, it's time for you to go. You know, but it was understood. People in the neighborhood, it was widely known, do not touch me with that game. So I'm going to put a button on this conversation, then we're going to get to Steve Kim. Just very quickly, look. So Stephen A is the drug dealers in Hollis, Queens. They all knew Stephen A is not to be touched. The biggest dope dealer in the area lived across the street from Stephen A. Don't touch Stephen A. Everybody knew he had all this potential, blah, blah, blah. So Jam Master J, he got murdered in a bad drug deal. He was involved in the dope game. And, and he allegedly double-crossed these two guys that ended up killing him. So at some point, and I, at some point, Jam Master J entered the drug game, drug world. No surprise, he's a rapper. But, but Stephen A has no connection to Jam Master J. 
even though he's this well-known prodigy in the neighborhood that had this future Winston-Salem State basketball career, and he was untouchable. But he didn't know Jam Master Jay. It's his brother who's seven years older than Jam Master Jay. That's who was tight with Jam Master Jay. It's Cap. Cap, for those of you in the audience that are Blaze TV subscribers, it's a lie. That's what cap means, lying, exaggerating, BS. Uh, so uh, that's your today's edition of Stephen A. Cap. Help me get to the bottom of this. Could we ask Stephen A. Smith to explain Basil's bizarre relationship with little boys in Hollis, Queen? Steve Kim next. Vince Everett Ellison, previously on Fearless. Another thing about King, a lot of people don't know. Uh, Margaret Sanger, as you know, Jason, started Planned Parenthood. Uh, you know, she had the Negro Project as a side project called Black People Human Weeds. And that her, 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 that her, her plan was to exterminate the whole black race. Well, guess who was the first recipient of the Margaret Sanger Award? Martin Luther King Jr. 1966. Yeah, he was having Margaret Sanger set up abortion clinics in the black community to a point where Margaret Sanger gave him an award. And when people say, well, King didn't know what was going to happen, da 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 I said, well, it's very funny that his family never gave the award back. They still have it. They're still proud of it. Martin Luther King Jr. was a, was a man behind the, was behind the uh, uh, man out clause in welfare. People say it's LBJ. No. All right, welcome back. Time for your favorite part of the show, uh, the part of the show that I have to tolerate because you like it. I have to put up with this guy. Uh, Steve Kim, the Korean Cosell. Uh, let's roll out to Los Angeles and bring in Steve. Uh, Steve. Pat McAfee <laughs> continues to stir the pot over at ESPN. Uh, he went on all the smoke with uh, Steven Jackson and Matt Barnes and released some more smoke towards Norby Williamson and ESPN talking defiantly. Uh, let's take a look at uh, what he had to say, and let's take a listen to what he had to say uh, with Steven Jackson and Matt Barnes. We don't have to even speak names, but you spoke a name and called out someone a suit. I mean, the, the courage to do that, and, and, and you got a lot of respect. You already had respect, but even more respect for doing that. Has there been any backlash, any conversation? Like Because like you said, there is a, 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 a give and take and, and, a, and, a give, and a tug between what people hung their hats on for years and made a lot of money and what is coming and what's, what it's going to be. I don't know. I don't know if there was any conversations that mm -hmm. happened behind, obviously. So, you know. Like, I thought that was a warning shot to that guy. You know, I didn't even think that was... A direct hit. Yeah, because I'm the, I'm the executive producer of my show. I report directly to Jimmy and Bob. So I'm not really viewing anybody as... Like, I saw everybody, like, Pat calls out his boss. I don't got a boss. Mm. <laughs> what are we... You know, like, what are we... Jim Pitaro, are we talking Jimmy Pitaro or Bob Iger? Like, is that who we're talking about? Because those are people that could technically be described as my boss. And like Burke Magnus as well, and I have a great relationship with him. But I think even Burke would say like, yeah, like we have a good, like we are talking like this as opposed to like this. And so that was just a warning shot to, I thought, a person that was, you know, at the same which is hilarious because he's the former president of the place. I guess a lot of people were a lot of fear of him. I did not. Like, right. I do not have, I, that guy, that guy left me sitting in his office for 45 minutes. No showed me when I was mm. supposed to have a meeting with him. Right. Uh, when five years ago, six years ago, whatever. No showed was. you. No showed. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So and he you was, remember that. What's that? And you remember that. His thing's an elephant brain, <laughs> there buddy. You go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I am. Um, yeah. Yeah. I got everybody's. Yeah. Yeah. And he also, <laughs> yeah. he also banned all my friends from coming on my show. So really? there was uh there was a ban of ESPN talent on my show on YouTube 
that came directly from him, which so much so that I started a hashtag ESPN stinks the day that everybody got banned from my show. It only trended for like eight, nine hours or something like that. And then that's the next day is when I met Jimmy Pitaro. Jimmy Pitaro called me and said like, hey, how do we, you know, what's the deal? And I told him about, you guys are banning my friends from coming on my show. Matt Hasselbeck who worked at ESPN, Jeff Passon worked at ESPN, Dan Orlovsky worked at ESPN. All these people that I've known since while, right. before they got into ESPN, mm -hmm. like they're not even allowed to come on my podcast or whatever, or my YouTube show, you guys banned it. So like that guy was not a fan of me or our operation for a long time. So then whenever ESPN signs us Ooh, and he, he runs Sports it. Center and our show, is now in place of Sports Center at noon. I'm a fan of Sports Center. We all watch Sports Center. I grew up on da na na, da na na. But there became like a war almost from behind scenes from like Sports Center people and like people that have been in ESPN a long time against us coming in and taking their jobs and all this other shit. And I didn't see it like that. We were like pumped that we made it to the big leagues. Like, hey, I'm pumped we're on a worldwide uh, leap. Like, yeah. that's how I viewed it. Come on, I, man. I complete, and this is what I'm talking about playing a checkers player, mm -hmm. like get the ESPN deal done. I'm like, this is awesome. Like we joined the ESPN team. So lucky to be here. We get access. And then immediately it's like, this guy sucks. This guy's ruining ESPN. And it's mm -hmm. not coming from people outside ESPN. It was coming from people within ESPN. And I did not expect that at all. So I immediately like, okay, I'm in war. Like mm -hmm. that's what, if that's what we're doing, we're in war. And then once you start learning about how shit's going behind scenes, things that are being said to people, things that are being leaked, the timing in which they're being leaked, it's like, oh, they're trying to kill me. Like they're trying to, they're trying to make our show impossible to advertise with. They're trying to make sure people wow. don't watch our show. So like, as I started learning that, I'm like, all right, well, that's not going to, I don't know how this has gone in the past with other people. It ain't going here. But yeah, this particular white trash kid from Pittsburgh, like, hey, suits, this ain't, this is not how this is going to go. So that was just a warning shot. I didn't, that wasn't even like supposed mm -hmm. to be uh and then obviously it goes big. And I heard from, this is no lie, no less than like 40 people that have worked at ESPN or used to work at ESPN. And they were like, thank you for yeah. saying what you said. And mm. I was like, well, if I really crafted a statement about that, I mean, I could have said something much better, but I also did not appreciate the thing I didn't think about once again, checkers player, I did not expect the backlash afterwards. Like Burke Magnus just became the president of content at ESPN. I think he has a great vision for what the future of sports media should look like. He was a big part of us joining ESPN. People were attacking Burke because it made him look sloppy because uh, okay. it's inside right, the building. Right, right. People were attacking Jimmy because it looked sloppy. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I did not think about. I was very apologetic about. Like, I didn't mean to take down my allies or right. make allies look bad in the whole thing, but I genuinely did not expect it to get as big as it did because I didn't think I said anything that was like mm -hmm. that crazy. No, you, you know kept what it I mean? real. Or like, I'm a pretty good talker, you know? I'm a pretty good promo cutter. <sighs> like if I really wanted to suck her down, like I thought I could have done it in a much bigger way mm -hmm. and I did not. So I was actually like pretty proud of myself. Yeah. I was like, look at me, that was a yeah. I'm an adult. And then it got loud. I'm an adult. It, I'm an adult and it got real loud. <laughs> yes, got man. real loud. Mm. This is fascinating, Steve, on many, many, many levels. Uh, your first reaction to what you just heard there from Pat McAfee. Um, I don't know. I mean, if you hate it there that much, get the fuck out. But I wonder if he went there on purpose to be a disruptor, mess things up, drink all the beer, mess up the bed, take a crap on the on the carpet, the oriental rug, and just walk out and say, I'm out. Because he has options. I don't know of a lot of people in corporate legacy media that would have the ability to say that about their boss, be so open about it, be so expansive about it. And I almost dare them to say, yeah, um, what are you going to do about it? But it's clear to me, Jason, that number one, this was never a great fit. And number two, I wonder if he realizes it's not a great fit. And maybe he thinks to himself, you know what, going back independent, I've made my point. Uh, I want my freedom back. But just leaving ESPN would not be the worst thing. Uh, yes, that is a possibility. And perhaps that's his strategy. But I'm not so sure, I, I, and the reason I say I'm not so sure is because of the venue 
he just chose to reignite this feud. He, he, he's being very calculated here. Why go on all the smoke? Two potheads, NBA guys with, you know, they're not journalists. They're, they're not, you know, wh why is he doing that? And so my first, and again, this, this is interesting on a million different levels, but Pat McAfee is being attacked by who? Stephen A. Smith is taking passive aggressive shots at him and basically playing the race card. If you don't play, pay me more than Pat McAfee, you're racist. So Stephen A. Smith and Pat McAfee can smile at each other's face and all that, but they don't like each other. Not, they're not on each other's teams. Ryan Clark just went after Pat McAfee in his contract dispute. And so <clears throat> there are a group of black uh, performers over at ESPN. Those are the two highest profile, Ryan Clark and, and Stephen A. Smith, that are upset with the money that Pat McAfee's making, and they're raising hell with executives about it. And now there's a bunch of people behind the scenes, lower level uh, ESPN personalities, that agree with Ryan Clark and, and Stephen A. Smith, and they're applauding this. And so Pat McAfee is at war. And so he's at war with the Black Lives Matter crowd over at ESPN. And so what does he do? Oh, let me go over here and mess with the kingpin of uh, the George Floyd lookalike, the George Floyd friend, the authentic member of the Bloods, uh, Steven Jackson and Matt Barnes, who has, you know, a lot of street credibility in that elite basketball world. He's chosen this venue intentionally. He's trying to shore up support uh, with his black allies or whatever and tamp some of that down. And, and so I, I think that's an indication of just how strategic he's being. And I think he thinks he can win this feud with Norby Williamson. And, and, and cause there's, Norby's not popular with all the executives there either. Cause Norby's been the ultimate survivor uh, at ESPN. And so there's probably some executives that would like to blow Norby out. Certainly the Black Lives Matter crowd uh, would like to blow Norby out. Th that's cause Jamel Hill, Michael Smith, they blame Norby uh, for their problems with the six and all that. So I think he's actually trying to win this war and score points with the BLM crowd that has a lot of influence over at ESPN, and that's why he chose this venue. That's one of my just initial takes. Look at the choice of venue. He could have gone on anyone's podcast and reignited this feud. He chose all the smoke intentionally. Yeah, I guess, but there's a part of me as a working class guy Hey, Pat, that's the destination you chose. Uh, no one likes to hear a millionaire complain or whine. I'm sorry, Jason. I don't. I'm like, Pat, you're either going to do the job in a first-class fashion and build up your brand, or you can leave. <laughs> I, that's the way I look at it. Like, all this, the machinations. First-class fashion's out the window at this point, though, Steve, don't you think? I, I, I'm he's you, he's not you know choosing first-class. Then you know what? Either do the job or leave. That's my view of it. I, honestly, um, you have issues with your boss. Okay, you have options. Pat, you could either leave or stay. I don't I th I don't want to make too much out of this. I'm not so sure he really thought it out that much. There's no doubt. He has a rivalry with certain people that are very jealous of him. But he had to understand what he's getting into. You are getting into corporate media. Um, I personally, if I was Pat McAfee a year and a half ago, I would have been like, yeah, I'm good. I'm kind of good without the rules because certain things to me are priceless. Number one is freedom and independence. I don't need a bunch of gatekeepers looking over my shoulder. I'd rather just do what I do. Um, but I don't, to me, I find great joy in actually doing the job and then putting on a great performance for my audience. But all this other stuff, I don't care about that. I really don't. Because you know why, Jason? The audience doesn't care. When that guy has to work a nine-hour shift uh, bailing out – uh, trash cans or working in the factory, he wants to turn on his TV, and you know what he wants Pat McAfee to do? Entertain him. That's it. It's. I mean, that's really Steve, that's when I turn Steve, on the show. Hold, I, I think want you're being. I know. I think you're being a tiny bit naive in, in terms of 
so you gotta remember who you are, what age you are, how set in your ways you are, and then, and I'm not saying any of that is bad. I'm saying that's, you're exactly where someone your age should be. But then you gotta think about the other audience and where everybody else is. He's got a younger audience, he's got an audience that believes in social media clout. He, he's got a, a remember he, he came to fame a bit with Barstool and that bro culture. And so his audience, him going to war with the ESPN establishment, his audience perhaps is entertained by his lack of professionalism, that he's, he's helping restore his brand that I didn't sell out. And bros, I'm still good with you all. And, and look at this mess I'm creating over here at ESPN. And so maybe in his back pocket, he's thinking I can go back to Barstool in a whole different capacity where Dave Portnoy, he could partner with and they would leave him alone and he could just do his whole thing there and protect his brand. Steve, I think he's being very strategic and, and that you're not and I'm not his typical audience member. I think his audience is very entertained by they all might, of this. They might be, but there's also going to be this blowback. Oh, yeah, you see the white guy? We couldn't talk to our bosses like that. So, I, you know, again, so you might actually alienate the people like the people that watch all the smoke may be looking at that. And I'm, I'm assuming that a pretty good amount of their audience is black, right? They're going to be watching this going, man, look at this white guy basically cussing out his bosses. We couldn't do that. I don't know. <laughs> that might create more tension for him, which, again, maybe he wants it, maybe he doesn't. I'm not really sure about that, to be honest with you. But I think Pat had to know what he was getting into when he paired up with the four-letter network. He should know, and, and, and you're right. Think of the other guy that he's been bickering back and forth with, not as... Obviously, but no, it's been pretty obvious. He and Bill Simmons have been taking shots yeah. at each other. And, and remember, Bill Simmons, he was supposed to be the rebel, the voice of the little people. And, and Pat McAfee has swallowed all that up. And, and he's like going to, and, and I'm sure Bill is sitting there halfway jealous, halfway, and I mean that with no negativity because I'm sitting here halfway jealous and confused and sitting here thinking the exact same thing that Bill Simmons is probably thinking. They thought I was a problem? And because and there was this whole deal like Bill Simmons was the biggest headache and management couldn't do this and management couldn't do that with him and behind the scenes Bill did this and he ran to John Skipper and did this and Bill Simmons is watching this Pat McAfee thing going, holy cow, I never did any of this. And, and I look at how they savage my reputation. And, and I'm sitting there thinking the exact, exact thing. I ate so much garbage when I was at ESPN and had to sit there and let people lie about me and those exact. And, and so there's part of me that's just, I would have loved to have done this to John Kozner and a few of these other guys that did the exact same thing they're doing to Pat McAfee. But I, I'm just, this thing, I, I don't, Pat McAfee and, and what he's doing is going to create so much tension like you're talking about and, and piss off the BLM crowd at ESPN. I, I don't think I'm being hyperbolic. He just may destroy this entire thing. He may just set it all on fire because how can any other employee say, like, you let Pat McAfee do this, how can you stop me from doing anything? And that's why Stephen A. Smith put together a 45-minute, one of the most unprofessional 45-minute rants you would ever see tolerated in corporate America. And he sat there, and I dare you to do something about it because look at Pat McAfee. Every ESPN talent from this day, for, they're all unmanageable because of what Pat McAfee's doing. I'm not sure about that because no, none of these other guys created their own brand. If Pat McAfee got fired right now from ESPN, you know who he would do next Monday? Restart his show. He'd be okay. The moment, I learned this at ESPN when I had to deal with editors who were scared to death of letting me write certain things. I had options. They didn't. They, because basically, they had mediocre talent. 
I, I had more balls than they did. And I said, you know what? I'll leave ESPN. I'll be okay. That, at a much higher level, that's Pat McAfee. Because if they said to Matt, Pat McAfee in 15 minutes, come to our office, give me your playbook, your cut. Pat would say, thank you. I got 30 other teams I can go to. Most of these guys don't. They are a spoke in that very big wheel. That's the truth. The options give you guts in this world. As it relates to Bill Simmons, I think the jealousy stems not just from the treatment of the media, because I don't get into all the weeds, don't care about that. I think Bill looks at Pat and said, that was supposed to be me. I was the guy that was supposed to anchor a variety daily morning show. I was the guy that was supposed to be on every single day in front of millions of people, talking and hosting and being our version of Johnny Carson or Arsenio Hall. Here's the reality with Bill Simmons. He was a very clever writer, enjoyed a lot of his stuff, done some good things with this production company. I've enjoyed the 30 for 30 series. And a lot of the vignettes and the features that he has produced, I've been a fan of. And I'm not a Boston fan in the least, but I get it. However, when it comes to hosting on air and carrying a show as the personality, that's where he has failed. And unfortunately for him, with the new media landscapes, if you cannot get out there and spit a little bit in front of a camera and do it live and do like lively segments with energy and have fun and be natural and make people feel comfortable, unfortunately, what worked for Bill Simmons in 2000 to about 2008 or 9 may not really fit his particular skill set in the 2020s. I want to slightly disagree with you. And, and just follow me here. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. What Bill Simmons, I think, is saying is, are you watching the Pat McAfee show? He's not a talented broadcaster. Bill Simmons mocked, hey, bro, bro, Aaron Rodgers, he's a dude. Bro, bro, he's a bro. You know, Bill Simmons mocks Pat McAfee's show. Pat McAfee is a persona and He's allowed to say things that Bill's like, well, I would have been a lot more entertaining if I were allowed to say and do what Pat McAfee hmm. is doing. And, and so I, I think Bill is sitting there saying, and I haven't watched enough of the Pat McAfee show to know this, but I, I get where Bill's coming from. The little bit I have seen, it's like, this guy's not a talented broadcaster. Mm. He says super provocative things. He throws tantrums and watching him do all of that. And Bill Simmons said, I was capable of throwing tantrums on air. I did them behind the scenes all the time. If they had allowed me to be this uncontrollable, I would have been fine. And I would have survived off a brand and a persona rather than actual television chops. Mm. That, yeah, that's but that's what objective. I yeah. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. The bottom line is this. I don't like, it's like a good popcorn movie. I don't care if Gene Shalit or, or I'm dating myself, Siskel and Ebert <laughs> gave it a thumbs down, this action summer popcorn movie, right? They all gave it a thumbs down and two stars out of five. Let me just say something. If I'm a movie studio and I'm like, oh, really? We did how many million every single day for the whole summer? That's a great movie. It doesn't have to be gone with the wind. It, it doesn't have to be some classic, but if it's Top Gun, right, and people's like, wow, we were entertained, we liked it, that's what really matters. And, and to Pat McAfee's credit, for several years, he went out there and sacrificed and did the work. And he maybe he hasn't evolved all that much as a polished broadcaster, but if he creates a persona and a culture on his show that people like, well, Bill Simmons or anyone else has to realize one thing. Welcome to the business of programming. Ratings matter. Well, and then Bill would argue on the other side, and other people would argue, go check his ratings. They're terrible yeah. on TV. And, and what Pat McAfee actually is, and what Bill's going to have to come to grips with, same thing I have to come to grips with, and, 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 and again, if Bill sees this, and again, it's, you know, I could care less whether he loves it, hates it, or what he thinks of me or whatever, but, but I'm not trying to disparage Bill Simmons here because I have the same thoughts. What Bill is actually arguing is, hey, the media won't even do an honest evaluation of, of Pat McAfee 
because the media is so stupid, they don't even understand what's going on. And Bill just wants this guy understood in proper context. Because if Pat McAfee were trying to pull this off before the popularity of YouTube, it would not work. YouTube has eliminated actual broadcasting talent from the equation. And, and so McAfee is benefiting from the time that we're in and Bill Simmons was damaged by the time that he was in. If, if, if Bill Simmons was, if, if he could dial the clock back 10, 12 years ago when he was at his height and if YouTube had basically eliminated broadcasting talent from the equation, Bill Simmons would have never been a flop uh, as a broadcaster. Mm -hmm. Because you can, because people are saying, and now, and McAfee would argue on the other side, like, hey man, I'm following up First Take and that all black hip hop audience they got, and that's why my ratings aren't working on TV. That's his argument. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. M people like me that actually a student of television broadcasting or whatever, nah, you're not a good TV broadcaster. You're a YouTube sensation. And, and just go look at how many people are having success on YouTube who never put their face on camera. They just talk, they just do voiceovers of videos and, and they're having a lot of success. YouTube has made it so you don't need talent, you just need bluster and train wrecks and beef. And again, we give you some beef here on this show. I'm not saying I'm, I'm above it. But, but you don't need broadcasting chops to have success on YouTube. And, and Bill's like, ESPN's still a television network. They're not holding this guy to a standard. The media won't talk about him properly. And so he's trying to let off smoke signals to say like, hey bro, bro, oh. <laughs> hey, bro, bro's not a good broadcaster. <laughs> Yeah, bro. <laughs> and it, it's clever. It, it's some jealousy and some hate, but that's what I think's going on here. I think the guy that's going to have a real issue, because he's always going to have an issue with it, is, is uh, Bromani Jones. He's probably looking at that saying, oh, my God, look at this guy ripping his bosses. He's probably very just, even though he's gotten more chances than he deserves. And honestly, if I'm Bill Simmons, I'd have more of an issue with Bromani Jones than I would Pat McAfee. Oh, he Pat certainly McAfee had an issue. Yeah. yeah, well, Pat McAfee's created a brand. Look, his television ratings, if they're bad, they're bad. All I know is this. Um, he created a brand that was successful on YouTube. I think YouTube's a pretty big platform. My guess is it's only going to get more ubiquitous. It's going to get even bigger. So if you were to tell me, Steve, right now, all things being equal and the money's relatively equal or it's not a factor, would you rather be a success on a linear network um, where you do have a boss and you have a contract, or would you rather be your boss with the YouTube channel? Now, both come with some issues, okay? But, they're, like I said, the freedom that you get from having a YouTube channel that is successful and that becomes a household brand with a built-in audience, that is priceless to me. I want to play you one little final clip from Pat McAfee that I, I, is interesting to me. I don't know if it's interesting to you. Uh, he, he lets, he states here in this All the Smoke interview, he, he tickles my funny bone and my issue, the thing that I've been arguing is like, none of these guys, and this is where, call it jealousy, call, I, I don't think I'm jealous, I'm just being objective and analyzing, but if you wanna say I'm jealous, then say I'm jealous, I got no problem with it. But. These guys aren't entering the profession. Pat McAfee isn't trying to pretend to be a journalist, isn't trying to pretend to do anything other than make money. Period. End of story. He's just like Stephen A. Smith. He's just like virtually everybody else in the, in the media now. Journalism, uh, pleasing sports fans, providing information to sports fans, none of that is an issue. It's just about making money. Pat McAfee lays it out. Whenever I was a teenager, like there had to be a real conversation between my dad and I, like to be rich at the time. And that's all I wanted to be was rich, which is why I wanted to be a professional wrestler because I turned on TV on Monday. Those rich. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Professional sports. Those 
<laughs> look rich. Comedians, those <laughs> look rich. Uh, show hosts, those <laughs> look rich. So like everything I'm doing right now is only because I wanted to be rich. Right. So like, what do you want to be when you grow up? I was asked. Rich. Rich and all these teachers <laughs> hated it. They hated it. Kid next to me, I want to be a teacher. He's a hero, right? To this right. teacher. <laughs> this kid over here wants to be a firefighter, like noble. I appreciate that. Pat, what do you want to be? Rich. Rich. That is Point all that is, that is literally all, bingo. I'm Rich. the worst kid of all time. That is, you know. So like oh, that's kind of how yeah. this is all kind of worked out. But, yeah, that is that is my entire life. I find that fascinating and very transparent and honest. A little bit repulsed by it because of my values. Uh, but your thoughts? I Look, I don't think money's everything. I've turned down jobs that would pay me okay or more. But I, I appreciate the honesty. We are capitalists, last I checked. Uh, he's worked for it. He puts in the work. And this is the reason why we have occupations, to get paid. <laughs> OK, um, I have never really uttered the phrase, well, the money doesn't matter. Well, are you people crazy? It always matters. It, it always matters. This is why we negotiate deals. This is why we have minimum wages and, and you try to get raises and you try to get promotions. Pat is just saying something that could be relatively uncomfortable to a lot of people. But in, in the words of Gordon Gecko, whether you agree with him or not, what was that phrase? Gentlemen greed is good and i mean now the the downside is will you do anything for money see that's where it gets a little cloudy to me like what is the price of fame that you're willing to pay uh as we're seeing in the hip-hop industry with freak mill i mean my god that's repulsive but anyway <laughs> getting back getting back freak i mean god, yeah oh my god uh thanks robert Kraft. you, you freed that guy anyway so the thing is it's okay to want money the problem is you become a slave to it. See, that's the fine line. Do you become a slave to it? And, and I see certain people that are in the media that have taken some interesting turns, and they're just doing it for the money. There's nothing honorable about what they're saying because I don't believe that they really mean it. So that's, that's where I stand on that whole thing. Great job, Steve. Uh, thank you, as always. I don't think we'll see Steve till next week. Uh, we'll play some tomorrow, and uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Waiting for the countdown, coming off the breakdown, standing in line for freedom. Looking for a breakout, feeling like a standoff, nothing in life like freedom. Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder, making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom. No negotiation, my sister, no relation We all just wanna have freedom Sitting on the corner, never been alone I'm breaking my back for freedom Bless, we are living, get back We are receiving, all deceiving We all wanna be free We want